Okay. Hi there. Uh, thanks a lot for sticking out with us. Um, today I'm going to speak around about driver jack, which is an uh, unusual technique to load the driver on Windows 11, uh, abusing NTFS features and CDFS, um, CDFS bug, I'd say. So just before starting, a few words about me. I'm Alessandro Magnosi. I work for BSI, British Standards Institute. Um, I mainly do research, but like a huge part of my uh, daily uh, business is uh, consulting in adversary simulation, device security, and AppSec. Uh, I go on the internet with the name Kletz Virus. You can reach me out on GitHub or, or Twitter. Like, feel free to reach out. Now, just uh, before starting, um, I, I'm going to just give a bit of uh, information about this project. This project was started in 2022. Um, with Jonas Leek uh, from, from Secret Club. Um, we started working on a POC to abuse ISOs to load malicious drivers on Windows. Then we completely forget about that uh, for at least one year because I was working on other stuff. And then in, in 2023, I had an engagement that supported the development of this technique a bit further. Now, the engagement was a bit um, like it was an OT engagement and uh, the main the main uh, aim of the SOT engagement was to deploy a kernel rootkit on an OT workstation. Now, regardless the, like, regardless the engagement, the engagement was pretty well, uh, and we found ourselves in a situation where we could tamper um, ISO files that were distributed to machines via an update catalog. Uh, so this gave us a motivation to re resume the uh, research that we were doing in 2022, and we tried to understand if we could develop it further. Now, we didn't know exactly what to expect from the malware that we were generating. Uh, we, just need, we just know that we wanted something to backcore an installer, present on an ISO, and then we want to weaponize it in a, the best way possible. Of course, ISOs have been weaponized for years right now for their ability to uh, to bypass multi-w but this was not really what we wanted to do we want we didn't want to just provide an iso to our uh, customer we had in the position of weaponizing an iso uh, and then we just wanted to execute some code and like deploy some vectors around i don't know if you uh, if you uh, are aware uh, who is aware about the um, what Stuxnet was doing back in 2011, but we wanted to achieve something like backdoor in DLL on different softwares to intercept communication, intercept code going and arriving from PLCs and doing stuff like that with uh, using side loading with hooking or uh, DLL proxying on uh, certain specific DLL used by this kind of software. And the, addi and the additional thing that we wanted to achieve was deploying a kernel driver on these boxes. Now, the, uh, we started, and one example of the ISOs that we end up backdooring was Step 7 Installation Media. And the reason for this is that it's naturally deployed by using ISO files. And it's pretty difficult to backdoor because um, Step 7 use, utilized a, back, a, a bootstrap to uh, launch the installer, meaning that, um, meaning that it actually performs an integrity check on the content of the disk before actually launching the installer. And it has two layer of checks, so you need to, but you need, you need to if you want to um, uh, execute malicious code using the installer, you need to find a way to not tamper with any existing DLL and any existing executable on the disk. Um, talking about deploying the Windows uh, rootkit, a Windows rootkit, um, Usually, when you need to deploy a rootkit on Windows, a kernel rootkit, a kernel driver on Windows, what you end up doing is you call create service, you create a service for the service driver, and then you start the service with the driver. Of course, one requirement for this is that the driver file that you are loading needs to be on disk. Um, now, this can be done manually by manually placing uh, a registry key in the file system and then calling anti-load driver to load the driver. This is a bit more stealth uh, way of loading a driver. And, it's, uh, and, and the name for this thing is Windows Log Event Evasion because it doesn't generate the event that is usually created when you create a service and start the service. But of course, there is something else that, uh, that sticks up. So like there, there is a, every time you, you load a driver, regardless if you're using the, ser the start service, the create service, or you use directly the anti-load driver uh, fun function. 
uh, you generate uh, an event, uh, which is the load driver event, that is a Sysmon event, and event six, that provides all the information about the driver you below So even if it's more stealthy, uh, there is still this that's the, that, that, that appears on, on, as an event on the Windows log. So we wanted a technique that would help us bypass this event load driver as well. Uh, and so we ended up creating four, uh, four libraries framework. I mean, two of them are the core of this presentation, which is IOCDFS uh, lib and driver jack uh, that will be abused to load a driver on Windows. The other two are collateral projects. They were not supposed to be part of the project. They, they just are RPC exec. I will just talk about it briefly. RPC exec is a less common way to execute on Windows uh, on local or remote processes without requiring uh, Rx memory to be allocated in target process. And interleaver is, uh, it became a sort of P manipulation library um, that we cannot share completely, but I will share a simple POC, which is coupling P. You can find coupling P, which is coupling preserve on my GitHub page. Now, coupling P is a short version of interleaver. It doesn't manipulate completely the, uh, the P file but it, it's an extension to what Nick Landers implemented back in 2020, I don't, I don't remember exactly. Uh, so coupling is a framework that takes a target DLL, clone the export address, the export address table, and uh, include it in a DLL that you developed. Uh, now this is used usually for DLL side loading using the DLL main function as a main entry point for the DLL. Now, the problem is that this process is destructive. So if you have some exports in your payload DLL, this will be erased. So coupling P just solves the problem and it just preserves the existing export address table and just add the forwards afterward. That's it. Not, 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 really, a, not really a difficult project. Uh, RPC Proxy Invoke instead, or RPC Exec, is a general library that we implemented to, as I said, is to execute code on local or remote processes. Uh, it's it's uh, borrowed by browser exploitation. It abuses the NDR server call to, to execute arbitrary calls. Uh, it doesn't require Rx memory, and we also implemented in a way that it doesn't require a valid RPC binding handle. For, uh, for execution. This is, this, there is a reason for this. We wanted something that we could use to execute arbitrary calls in any server, even in any service, in any processes, even if it wasn't actually using RPC. And we wanted to avoid maintaining, like we wanted to be able to erase tracks if we wanted. And using this technique, we can load RPC, initialize it remotely, execute our stuff, uh, our stuff, and then just get rid of RPC RT4 completely by freeing the library, and no traces will remain in the service, the process. Uh, the code is there. There are also some demos around um, that you can check. It's just for functionality. The project code is implemented, and it has some, not limitation, but is implemented nerfed, uh, meaning that it's not using, for example, uh, code pattern search for uh, for locating the required, uh, the required entry point in RPC RT4. RPC RT4 changes over time a lot, so you'll need to adjust it to, depending on your version, on your Windows version, or you need to implement yourself the code that actually do the pattern searches. Previous research. So when it comes to the core of the research, so loading a driver on Windows, you have a few ways to load a, a valid driver or an unsigned code on the Windows, to execute unsigned code on the Windows. You can either, actually there are four. So the fourth one was implemented by Gabriel Landau not long ago uh, by exploiting a new vulnerable class that is false file immutability. I didn't put it in the slides just because it wasn't available when I started doing this research, but go check it out because it's an incredible research. Uh, but the standard way to uh, load unsigned code on Windows are either you, it's not unsigned, you, you load signed code, so you have a kernel driver that you want to load, you uh, join the, um, you join the um, Microsoft developer program, Microsoft sign your own driver and you're good to go. You can use a fake signature, so before 2015, Microsoft allowed um, kernel drivers signed with a, with a valid code signing certificate and cross-signed by an EV uh, CA certificate 
to load on Windows. So if you have a certificate that was expired before or issued before 2015 and you have a leaked EVCA certificate, you can still use, you can still set up your own uh, fake uh, timestamp server and you can back sign one of these drivers and you can uh, generate a signature that is expired, so signed with an expired certificate, but still valid to load on Windows. Uh, the, the third and last technique was uh, using a vulnerable driver. Now, as you can understand, we didn't have, we didn't have any kernel driver uh, on the developer program. We didn't have any EVCA certificate leaked and unknown that we, can, that we could use, so we went to the route of uh, using a vulnerable driver to load our unsigned code. Now, of course, we then started the research to hunt for abusable vulnerable drivers and we found four of them, two of them we just uh, report to the vendors because they were not useful to us, two of them we kept them. Um, now usually when you want to load unsigned code on Windows you search for, of course there are a lot of vulnerabilities affecting vulnerable drivers, buffer overflow, user after free, there are a lot, not just this that I that I um, that I included here, but usually what you want is to have a stable, a stable physical memory read write, virtual memory read write, or for example, uh, unprotected MSR access. Um, MSR stands for model specific register. Now the first, this was abused a lot in 2018, 2020. So when you have, and it appears when you have an when a restricted code uh, called to uh, WR uh, MSR. So there is a specific model specific register on Windows, which is the, uh, well, actually not on Windows, it's not specific to Windows, but it's the IA 32 uh, star that contains on Windows the pointer to um, the system call dispatch function. So on, before KPTI was introduced, uh, this points to KI system call 64. After KPTI mitigation, uh, this points to KI system called 64 uh, shadow, but regardless, this points to a dispatch function that is responsible to switch to um, that is responsible to switch to um, from user mode to kernel mode and execute and dispatch to the relevant system call uh, handler on kernel side. Now, if you have an unrestricted call to and you can override this register, what you can do is you can weaponize it to point to your user defined. Uh, handler, and this is abused in MSR exec by Xerox uh, from back engineering, uh, magnificent tool, I have to be honest. Um, and this literally implements its own uh, dispatch function that swap to kernel mode using the swap JS uh, instruction, uh, disables maps map, and executes arbitrary code uh, stored in a user mode buffer. Uh, afterward, it uses ROP to, sorry, it uses ROP to uh, restore SMAPS map and restore the IA uh, L32 L star. Now, this the other the other vulnerable pattern that we have is arbitrary physical memory access. Now, uh, usually when uh, this this presents itself in two forms, either a call a restricted call to ZW map your sec um, section or that can map whatever physical address in a linear address, or by using MMAP IO space. Now, the vulnerable pattern that we found the most was this. It's abusable, it's less abusable than ZW map view section because these actually provide uh, access that uh, you can't specify the access right, so you, can, you can't specify read write uh, instead of read. And this usually is used for privilege escalation. So if you have a pattern that like this, so you have a call to MMAP IO space, IO allocate MDL, and then MM build MDL for non-page pool, and then MMAP lock page specif specify cache, you have a pattern where you can actually uh, allocate page, memory, uh, page pool memory, sorry, non-page pool memory in a user mode buffer and using a technique known as proc scanning, you can identify e-process structure in the non-page pool and swap tokens around to achieve uh, privilege escalation. And then there is the prints of all other vulnerabilities, uh, arbitrary virtual read, arbitrary kernel virtual uh, memory read write. This presents itself in a lot of different ways. Can be a mem move, a mem copy, a ZW vir write virtual memory. It can be a, a direct pointer assignment. Uh, it can be whatever. Now this is used for a lot of different stuff. Uh, let alone bypass DSC, for example, or just mapping arbitrary stuff in memory, in kernel memory. And this is uh, heavily abused by tools like ADMapper or KDU 
to load your driver in memory. Now, of course, Windows doesn't like this, uh, so they started introducing a lot of different mitigations. Since 2018, there was the, introdu the introduction of uh, KPDI after the Spectre meltdown uh, attack. Uh, then they started introducing VBS, virtualization-based security, and started enforcing HVCI. After the HVCI, they introduced KDP, which we will see. And then they implemented the Microsoft uh, driver block list, and afterward, they started introducing support first for kernel chat, control enforcement technology that uh, neutralize, neutralizes ROP-based attack. And then, in like weeks ago, uh, they announced that Windows 11 24H2 will support uh, Intel DTRP, redirection protection that kills another bug class that we will gonna see in me, like now. So, VBS is a uh, is really is really tough for uh, for exploiting vulnerable drivers because HVCI want to prevent you from abusing a vulnerable driver to load your VTL0 rootkit in memory. Now, how it works? Well, you have now the Windows load is 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 runs on top of the hypervisor, and uh, it divides the it divides the 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 trust level into trust level the VTL1 and VTL0. Now your own kernel runs in VTL0. Now, this is the guest uh, operating system, the guest OS, and what it, what, it, what, it man, what it does is that this uses a normal uh, page-structured approach to, for address resolution to map a physical address into a linear address. So you have your CR3, you have your, um, you have your uh, PML4 entry, then you have your uh, page directory pointer entry, then you have your page directory entry, the page table entry, and then finally you have your, fi your physical address. This physical address, though, is a guest physical address, meaning that there is another layer, second layer access translation, that is, translates a guest physical address into a real physical address that is managed entirely but by, by the hypervisor. Uh, using extended page tables. Now, what is the problem for us? Is that before this was introduced, page protection was kernel-based. So when you had control of kernel, you could do literally anything. So if you had a virtual, if you had a virtual read-write, you could literally locate the DG options, for example, that is the global variable and like managing the driver signature enforcement, and you could just override it. You could nullify it, load your unsigned code, and then restore it, of course, because it, even though it was possible to modify it, it was still protected by kernel patch guard. Um, so KPP, kernel patch, uh, yeah, patch guard. Uh, but now, now it's different, because now the enforcement is done at hypervisor level. Now, HVCI does two things, and in, together with KDP, that's a lot of problems. Like HVCI enforces that any page is either writable or executable, can be both. So this is designed to um, to avoid you from writing your own code in kernel memory and then execute it. So, and now this protection is enforced on hypervisor level, meaning that you even if you have your fantastic read-write primitive. Uh, you can't change the protection of a page because even though you are changing the protection of the page on the first level address translation, this memory protection does not propagate to the second level address translation and it's there that the protection is enforced. So if you have read-write, it's going to be read-write even if you change the protection on VTL0. And if it's read-execute, it's going to be read-execute even if you try to change the protection on VTL0. And with KDP, you have another problem because certain area of memory, data section of memory, are protected by this KDP that enforces that the page is read-only. So, for example, G-Option is protected that way. So now, even if you have an arbitrary read-write, and the page should be read-write, it's actually read-only, so even if you have it, you can't change G-Options to zero anymore. So what is the strategy around this? Well, luckily, someone very smart, smarter than me, of course, uh, developed a technique which is called page remapping. And page remapping attack exploited, um, it's not a bug, it's like a limitation of KDP. KDP doesn't enforce how pages on the guest are translated to pages on the host system. Meaning that 
not enforcing that, what I can do, one possible thing I can do is I can copy over my con the content I want to modify to another page. I can modify the um, the page structures on VTL0 to make it point to a read-write page on the hypervisor level. And this will effectively make my page read-write. And I can modify then the content. So Satoshi Sanda developed a proof of concept and used, used a null byte page to uh, nullify DSC in exact this way. Now, this is also abusable for executing arbitrary code. Um, and we have two main strategies for executing arbitrary code, even if HVCI is enabled. So this depends a lot on the, um, this depends a lot on the uh, Intel CPU level. So if you, have, if you have any CPU that is before Tiger Lake, before 11th generation, you can still use ROP because this kind of CPU does, do not support chat. So you can use Kernel Forge. Kernel Forge is a technique implemented firstly by Crash and also discussed by Connor McGar uh, in, his, in a blog post. And he uses a thread and a dummy event to modify the, kernels, the, the, thread, the thread kernel stack uh, at runtime meaning that it will replace frame on the kernel side of, the, of a thread to make it execute a ROP chain on return, executing arbitrary code. And on, if you instead you have a, a CPU that is before 12th generation, you can use the page remapping attack, as I said, uh, that abuses MALC. Now, why before 12th generation? I can say, actually, I should say, a CPU before 12th generation and before Windows and a version of Windows before 24H2 because, as I said, uh, Windows 11 24H2 and uh, supports Intel VTRP. That is a killer exactly for this kind of attack for page remapping attack. So it avoids any user from being able to redirect a page from VTL0 to remap to another page in the in the host system. Now, and what about if we have something, what about if we have something uh, more? Um, I actually, I actu I'm actually exploring some other technique for trying to bypass HVCI, but currently these are the only way. I uh, thought that large pages could also be used for this kind of thing, but apparently it's not gonna, it's not really working. So, but we still, even if we can do stuff, we still need to load a vulnerable driver to execute any of these strategies. So if we want to load a vulnerable driver, we need to be aware that there is something called driver block list that will probably prevent us from loading a known vulnerable driver on Windows. Now, the driver block list is a blacklist, and of course it has some problems that were identified by Will Dorman and Yarden Shafir, another researcher. The block list by itself is, is just a collection of ashes and uh, file names and file versions that are supposed to be not loaded on Windows. And if the driver block is enabled, it will prevent normal, uh, normal vulnerable drivers to be loaded, but it has a measure flow. The coverage is ridiculous. So uh, I, I made a, bit of, a, a little script to check how many, uh, how many drivers were blocked from the load driver projects. Uh, this just check the um, the ashes, but it's 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 really it's really ridiculous. The coverage is really ridiculous, and also it can be disabled by admin. Uh, of course, when we bypass the block list, we need to be aware that there is also the CRL. The CRL. So even if a driver is not in the block list, it doesn't mean that the certificate is still valid. So there are other there are other there are there are other things that may prevent us from loading a a, a vulnerable driver on Windows. And now, to the meat of this presentation, what can we do to load a, malicious, a vulnerable driver on Windows using this, like, unusual technique? So let's talk about a bit about the Anti-Object Manager. So the Anti-Object Manager is a subsystem on Windows that provides access to resources uh, using a name-value approach. It's not entirely correct, but it's the most, it's the most accurate the, the simplifi simplification. Uh, it provides access to these objects using a unified API, and uh, it, like every object, is 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 uh, it can be indexed by uh, using a name, can be uh, recovered using a name, and these names are uh, categorized in uh, in categories that we call namespaces. 
Now, uh, you probably already seen the uh, object manager in WinObject, sees internals, and you can see a graphical representation of the object manager. So you have all these objects with the type associated, and uh, you have the name categorized in namespaces. Now, usually, uh, when you this is actually used, um, this categorization is used because any namespace has a certain accessibility. So if I want, for example, to make uh, an object available in to the Win32 layer, I usually use a symlink that connect the global, which is the global um, namespace to the specific object I want to, I want to connect it with. And this is what you usually do even with drivers, uh, for example. Now, the empty object manager uh, is in, uh, of course, uh, provides access to object to other subsystems like the IO manager, the process manager, the, man the memory manager, etc. And whenever, whenever an object of type file is, uh, is 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 accessed by the IO manager, the IO manager will immediately check the file object and will dispatch it to the relevant dryer that is meant to handle that, that specific file object. Now, the NTFS driver manages the NTFS file system. What kind of file system is the NTFS file system? So the NTFS, uh, NTFS is a complex file system. Uh, it was always designed by Microsoft for extensibility and to support different kinds of other file systems like FAT32, etc. And the main, the, the main thing that I want you to memorize for now is that every file on Windows is a set of attributes, of course, and every file has at least one stream associated. So every file on Windows is actually, can actually be referred to as a triple. It's a triple. Triple, triple, either. So, um, so and, um, and usually you have Oh, I don't know what I'm seeing. So usually you have the file name, the stream type, uh, the stream name and the stream type. Every file has at least one stream. So if you specific, if you create a file with just the file name, you are immediately, it means that the other, the, the stream name and the stream type are defaulting back to something. For files is the data stream and for directories you have the index allocation stream. But they are usually always a triple. Uh, now, Another thing I want you to memorize is the concept of reparse points. Because it was meant for extensibility, uh, NTFS supports a lot of type of reparse point. The main and common, the most common reparse points that you will see in NTFS are three, although there are like 20 or 30 different reparse tags, so reparse types, so reparse point types. So the main, the most common are junction points that points directory, that links directory to directories, uh, mount points that links directories to drive to to mounted drives and symbolic links that link files to other files so this is not to be confused with link file link file are regular files they have a data stream and they are just regular files so they need to be parsed to access to another location on the file system uh, indeed symbolic links are an NTFS features meaning that they are just they are just literally link on NTFS, they link directly on NTFS uh, to another file. And usually a reparse point is always a reparse tag, which in this case is symbolic link, and a reparse, reparse data that will actually point to the real file that is pointed to. Now, about CDFS, CDFS is a way more, um, it's a way simpler file system, it, it, just, it just comprises a root directory and then it has directory end and then there has directory entries and file entries that are associated and are always parsed from the root directory. is um, is an implementation of the ISO uh, 9667 and 9660 and um, the important thing is that the CDFS file system, <laughs> the CDFS file system uh, is also uh, also apply, applies to optical disk as much as applies to ISO files. So ISO files are a virtual implementation of this CDFS file system. Now, just to give a bit of difference to the NTFS, of course, CDFS does not support reparse point, does not support a lot of things that are supported by the NTFS, but also it has a completely different threat model. So NTFS supports rich permissions. So it has an, AC, an ACL 
and the ACL is associated with different AC entries, uh, access control entries, which define what, what can be done on each file by each user in the system. For CD file system, this is not a problem because the content on a CD is supposed to be, is supposed to be immutable. So everyone has access to a file system. If you mount a drive, anyone, an admin, a regular user, anyone has access to the mounted files, to the files on the mounted drive. And yeah, as I said before, the CDFS driver, as much as NTFS driver, communicates with the IO manager. The IO manager have a, uh, has a request to access a file and after passing through the filter manager, it provides access to the required NTFS or CDFS driver um, accordingly to what is the device driver associated with the file object. Now, when you load an ISO on Windows, what it, what it's, the CDFS driver will automatically load the content of this uh, ISO file using the CD common read. Now, one thing that I want to stress out here is that an ISO file, in comparison with a CD, with an optical CD, an ISO file uh, is mapped in uh, physical memory, somewhere. So somewhere, this ISO file is mapped in memory. Uh, so this creates some problems, and we will see what exactly. So when you try to access a file, what you end up doing is you end up calling the NTCC copy read. Co copy read. Now, this points to a file object. We will describe the file object and just exploring a bit with where, this, where these file objects were located, we started noticing that the physical address associated with these file objects were always the same. So if you remap one of these file objects in a read-write page and you overwrite the content of this file object, the file object will, be, will flush the uh, content of the modified file back to the physical memory where the ISO was loaded. This means that it's not read-only at all. And so we developed this IOCDFS lib that you can use to uh, just modify any content on any ISO file that was mounted in the system. Now, I want to, I want to specify this doesn't work for CD, real CD drive. It just works for ISO files and the reason is potentially that it's because they are mapped on physical memory when they are loaded the first time. Of course for caching. Indeed they are more, uh, it's easier to get a file on, on an ISO in, in comparison with, uh, with a CD. Now I'm not gonna go through this but there are some limitation on what you can change on the file so if you overwrite over the file uh, sides uh, the real file sides not the file sides on disk but the the virtual sides it's the change is not gonna it's not gonna appear so you can you can you can change less but you can change more and if you write you try to write over the file on over the file sides on disk you end up actually breaking some stuff so your program will crash probably um, and you're gonna have problems. So these are the margin tolerance where, where, where you can actually replace the file. Now, but it, it, this is cool, but it's abusable. Now, yeah, it's abusable. There are some use case scenario where we can actually abuse it uh, for a lot of different means. But one of the means is I, the fact that we have a driver on an ISO, for example. We can load an encrypted blob on an ISO and then we can just modify it after the ISO was emulated. So we found another thing that we could abuse, and this is, um, I don't know how much it's, this is known, but like if we have a file on disk and we try to link, we try to use the same name to, to create a link, of course the file is going to say, no, I'm not going to use this name because it's already here. But for some reason, if we specify the link name with a stream name associated to it, it will create a reparse point for the file. So this will create a reparse point for the file that will overshadow the data stream that is present on the file on disk. Now this means that at this, at this time, after I created the reparse point, the file oh, and the, the original file, the original ATXT is still there, but it's not going to be, no one is going to be able to find it unless I delete the reparse point. 
And this is abusable. Why? Because, well, I can create an ISO and I can use this as trusted installer. I need to elevate my privilege to trusted installer. And I can use this to redirect the, a file, a driver file on C, Windows System 32 to something that is on the ISO, for example. But this has a problem. The driver, of course, the driver file, the driver location, the image loaded is going to be, is going to show that I'm loading something bad. So I be a bit more smart, a bit smarter. I create another ISO. And this point, I will use a coherent directory structure. So now I, and I, I place W, of course, I can place whatever driver I want here. Here, for example, there is WinIO. And I do the same thing, but still I have a problem because when I load the driver, it still say, okay, this sounds correct, but there is still, I mean, it's still saying, listen, you are loading from an ISO file. You're not loading from the system boot directory. You're loading from just an external drive. You're trying to fool me. You didn't manage to, though. Then... Uh, this is just to show that the file is still there. So if, I, if you delete the reparse point, the original file is still there, okay? Just to, just to prove the point. But then we notice another thing. So a direct NTFS link is not enough to bypass to fool the, the, the load driver event. But then we notice another thing. If we go to the empty object manager, we notice that every driver is actually loaded not using C Windows System 32, but is loaded using system root, system 32 driver and the name of the driver. What is this system 32? The system 32 is a symbolic link and not an, not, not an NTFS symbolic link, it's an NT symbolic link uh, that is pointing to the device that I use for booting. In my case, it's device are this volume three, but it's pointed to by the boot device, right? But this means, and if I inspect the boot device, I notice that I can actually delete this sim link. So this is actually a permanent sim link, meaning that it's been artificially created to have a ref count of one, but I can make it, I can, as system, I can make it temporary, low, like artificially lowering the ref count to zero again, and then I can delete it. So what can I, what can I do with this? I, I can obtain system privileges, I can, back up the original boot device, I can replace the boot device sim link with the ISO, and then I can restart the service and see what happens. And what happens is that it works, but the driver load event still shows that I'm loading from an ISO, so still I wasn't able to fool it. And Another problem is that if I inspect the driver in System Informer or a similar tool, I've noticed that the driver is showing, for example, a missing description. It's showing stuff that indicates that I loaded a another driver. What if we swap the drive letters? What if I do a drive swap for... This is something that nobody will ever think of doing, and there is a reason for that. Because if you try to swap the drive letters, your program, your, your system will probably crash at a certain point. There is nothing. But if you do it for just a second and you keep everything consistent, so you don't just remove the letters, but you swap him to other letters, it actually might work. So the, I'm not showing the screenshot because I'm showing you a video afterward, but the, the technique is this. We mount an ISO with an encrypted blob. We just respect the directory structure. We change the boot device to CD-ROM, we swap drive letters, we load the driver, we restore immediately the drive letters, we restore the boot device, and then we can, at, at that point, we can use, we can abuse the driver that has loaded in memory, even if we unmount the ISO file. Now, what about using other techniques? Well, I, I can use other techniques uh, to, to load the malicious driver, uh, but in this case, for example, I can use uh, all the partition that is assigned to the transactional file system. It's not supposed to be accessible by any user. It's not supposed to be writable. But we discovered that if you access this kind of location with the additional, with, with, the, with, the, with the required permissions, 
in this case backup intent, say restore, say backup privilege, a maximum file, maximum allowed as, uh, as, uh, as access right, you can actually override this. You can actually access these locations and you can actually write files on them. So, and this is a proof, of course, where I actually am, write, am writing on uh, the transactional file system uh, locations. Is there any benefit? I don't see any benefit in doing it. Uh, it can just give you an additional way of exploiting the same vulnerability in, in other ways, not using an ISO. So let's demo it. So Windows 11, HVCI is enabled. Uh, I have a simple load of a driver and I hope, uh, I hope it actually, because this doesn't actually, oops. Oops, I did a mistake. Okay. So it doesn't show, I don't know how to make play. Like it doesn't show the right. Uh -huh. Okay, now it seems it works. Yeah. So, okay, here we are seeing that we are targeting the AALP SSI GPO is an Intel driver and we are loading our driver, we are switching everything and we're loading the driver. Now the driver has been loaded, the name is that, and if you can see, honestly, I would, I would challenge you spot the difference. The description is the right one, but, and if you try to point to the, what, what file was loaded, it will actually open the right directory, but indeed we loaded another, you can, you can actually spot it from the sides from the size, it's 28 kilobyte, which is the size of WinIO. And you can see also from the ash, that is the same ash of WinIO, which is a vulnerable driver that is not currently blocked by Microsoft Blocklist. We can do another attempt, this time on Windows. I don't know if there is anything I'm showing. Yeah, I'm, sh I'm proving that is WinIO here. So you will see that there is the WinIO handle uh, showing up in devices, and when I will get there, bit of fate. So we have WinIO loaded. Now, when I unload the driver, that is not unloadable usually, WinIO disappears. So it was WinIO all along, but it doesn't show up anywhere practically. And we fooled the driver load event into thinking that we actually loaded a driver on C Windows System 32 as, as, as it was normal. Now, on Windows 10 or when HVCI is not enabled, we can just strictly integrate it with KDU, for example. Same technique, same driver as base uh, for exploitation. I still need to, no. Come on. Yes. So still driver jack is executing, arrives. It overwrites the content in memory because the driver is encrypted, as I said, on the ISO. And then it just loads the drive and straight executes KDU. The vulnerable driver was already loaded because we loaded to the driver jack with the driver jack technique. The name is WinIO and we can execute our unsigned code on Windows. Now, of course, if you want to execute with HVCI enabled, you need to use one of the other thing that I showed before, Candleforge, uh, Malk, or unless uh, if, if or, or you can use, or you can just disable HVCI altogether. So the full chain that we used was we weaponized the step seven installation media, um, in, in this way, initially, we use the child process immediately because, as I said, uh, the setup of the step seven installation media uses multiple process to install. So we could blend in with an additional process. We rewrite and execute an additional file. So we, there was no malware on the ISO except of a minimal DLL used for site loading. And then what we do is we use driver jack, we, we, execute, uh, we installed the full kernel rootkit. Uh, we were targeting Windows 10, HVCI was not a problem in this case. And, and then we just 
keep going with additional, with additional compromise step. So portability, we have integration with KDU uh, if HVCI is disabled. If it's enabled and you have uh, Inter KChat not supported, you can use CandleForge, as I said. If it's, um, if HVCSI is, HVCA is, HVC, oh my gosh, is, is uh, hypervisor protected code, enforced code, code integrity is enabled and you don't have Intel VT but you have Intel KChat can use Mark. Otherwise, well, the, the best chance so far uh, is to just uh, disable code integrity and ask for a reboot um, because there is no currently, there is not currently a technique. As I said, I, I mistakenly believe that you could actually abuse large pages for it. I'm still trying to check it if, if it's possible, but it doesn't look like it's working fine. And as key takeaways, I mean, you can download the POX uh, the, the, for driver jack is, is, already, is already public. You can, you can go and take a look. Um, for like detection, as detection advice, I would always try to detect if uh, someone is escalating privileges to system or trusted installer using known means. Uh, monitor for drive letter change to just prevent this trick from uh, bypassing detection. Uh, of course, monitor for changes in the anti-object manager, especially for global links. Uh, keep your hardware up to date is very important because as, as we've seen, the more we go to modern CPUs, etc., the, the more difficult it is to exploit these kind of bugs. And then, and then there is the one of the detection opportunity, which is the probably best, is when there is a, dro a driver load event, implement a NASH cross check. So. There is a NASH present on the driver load event. The only thing you need to do is going on the file list, on the file path that, is, was, that was loaded, perform, like calculate the check at runtime, and then compare the, the ashes. The ashes is, are not possible to fool. So uh, if the ashes are not matching, it means that something happened that was bad. So another driver was loaded in place of the original one. And that's it. Thanks a lot for for attending.